Let's think about some reasons why it is so important for us as healthcare providers to understand the principle of osmosis. So as we've done before, let's think about a normal systemic capillary with individual endothelial cells comprising the capillary membrane. And we notice that there's small gaps between the individual capillary cells. We know that the blood enters from the arteriole. Here's some red cells going through, draining via a venule. And we know that there's tissue cells surrounding the capillary. Now, the reason that the tissue fluid forms is because the hydrostatic pressure at the arterial end of the capillary is greater than the osmotic pressure. So tissue fluid forms. Bathing the tissues, forming the interstitial fluid. And we know at the venous end of the capillary, the osmotic pressure is greater than the hydrostatic pressure, meaning that the tissue fluid is reabsorbed. But what are the osmotic molecules involved here? Well, you probably know that in plasma there's going to be lots of sodium ions. About 135 to 145 millimoles per litre would be the normal levels of plasma sodium. We also know that there's some potassium ions in the plasma, about 3.5 to 5 millimoles per litre is the concentration of potassium ions you would expect. And we also know, of course, that there's chloride ions in the plasma. You might expect 95 to 107 millimoles of, millimoles of chloride ions per litre of plasma. Now, I've noted that the gaps in the endothelial cell membranes are small. They're semi-permeable. The water molecules will get out because the water molecules are small. But of course, the ions, the sodium, the potassium and the chloride are also very small. So they can get out as well. So what we end up with is the same concentration of sodium and potassium ions in the plasma, in the intravascular compartment, and in the tissue fluid in the interstitial compartment. And this is important because sodium is very osmotic. If we had a situation where we had a lot of sodium ions on one side of a cell membrane and no sodium ions but water on the other side of the cell membrane, that could be very osmotic, especially at these sort of concentrations of 135 to 145 millimoles per litre. So these are about the same on both sides of the cell membrane, meaning there's no great osmotic potential on either side of the capillary endothelial vascular membrane generated by the sodium, the chloride and the, the potassium ions. Interestingly, inside cells, the situation is different. Inside the cells, the levels of sodium is very low, but the levels of potassium are very high. So in plasma and tissue fluid, it's low levels of potassium but high levels of sodium. And in the intracellular fluid, it's going to be high levels of potassium but low levels of sodium. So given that these ions are the same on both sides of the membrane, what is it that's generating the osmotic potential? Well, of course, the answer to that is the plasma protein molecules. Because we mentioned that this membrane is semi-permeable, it is a semi-permeable membrane and it's permeable to water molecules and to small ions which of course are only on an atomic scale the sodium potassium chloride ions but the protein molecules are huge and they do not fit through the gaps in the endothelial capillary cell membrane so it's semi-permeable because it's not permeable to protein but it is permeable to these other substances. 
So really what that means is the only difference between the intravascular compartment and the interstitial compartment is the presence of these plasma proteins. And it's the difference between the lack of plasma proteins here and the presence of plasma proteins here that develop the osmotic pressure. Now, actually, if you take the whole osmotic pressure altogether, the vast majority of the osmotic pressure is generated by the sodium ions. The amount of osmotic pressure generated by the plasma proteins is actually only about half a percent of the total 100% generated by the ions. So it's a relatively small amount. But because it's so important, we give the osmotic pressure generated by the plasma proteins a special name, and we call that the oncotic pressure. So the oncotic pressure is the total of the osmotic pressure generated by the plasma proteins. Sometimes it's called uh, colloidal osmotic pressure because these are large colloidal molecules. So the oncotic pressure is the proportion of the total osmotic pressure, but of course that's the only difference between the plasma and the tissue fluid. So it's the presence of the plasma proteins generating this oncotic pressure, which is sucking the water back in to the intravascular compartment at the venous end of the capillary. Let's think of one reason why this is so important. Suppose someone, for whatever reason, was hypoproteinemic or hypoalbuminemic. They didn't have enough albumin in their plasma. That would reduce the oncotic pressure. Therefore, less water would be reabsorbed at the venous end of the capillary. Therefore, the patient would become edematous. Fluid would be retained in the interstitial compartment, making the patient edematous. So, one very important reason there why we need an understanding of osmosis. I think we'll give another uh, quick one at this point. Let's, let's think about... Uh, intravenous fluids. Now what concentration is the saline that you give in your intravenous fluids? When you put a drip up, how much saline is normally in it? Well you probably remember it's normally 0.9% saline because that is the amount of saline in plasma. 0.9%. So here we have a red blood cell. And the red blood cell is going to contain sodium, potassium ions inside, particularly potassium ions inside. And there's going to be sodium ions in the, in the plasma. But in physiology, we get movement of water out of the red cell and movement of water into the red cell, but it's the same amount of movement. There's an equilibrium of water between the environment inside the cell and the environment in the plasma roundabout. Because the osmotic potentials in the red cell are set up for that 0.9% concentration, the 135 to 145 millimole concentration of, of sodium in the plasma, 0.9%. Now suppose we gave pure water. Never do this, it's frightening just to think about it. But suppose we gave an intravenous solution which contained pure water. That would mean there's lots of water molecules in the plasma because we'd given intravenous pure water. And there'd be relatively less molecules of water in the red cell. In other words, we've changed the osmolarity of the plasma. And if something, if a solution has less osmotic potential than the plasma, we call that a hypotonic solution. So pure water would be hypotonic. The 0.9% saline, of course, is the same osmolarity of the plasma. That's isotonic. But now we've given this grossly hypotonic solution. Which direction are the water molecules going to go in? Well, osmosis is movement of water from a watery area 
which you've now made this a watery area because you made a mistake in giving intravenous water into a less watery area. So we get a net movement of water into the red cells. And the red cell would get fuller and fuller and fuller until eventually it would just burst. There would be hemolysis or hemolysis. And of course, that's a dangerous pathological situation. So we never want to give greatly hypotonic solutions. We want to give isotonic 0.9% saline. If we give large volumes of intravenous water, well, I don't even know what volumes we'd have to give, but we don't want to give any significant volumes of intravenous water because we're going to get hemolysis and this is a potentially life-threatening situation. So we don't want to give hypotonic solutions. But suppose we gave 5% sodium chloride, a very, very hypertonic solution, much more osmotic than the plasma should be. Now, in this situation, we've got lots of sodium here. That means that relatively, because we've got lots of sodium, relatively, we've got less water and there will be relatively more water inside the red cell. So in this situation, we've generated a watery area inside the cell, and because we've given 5% saline, which is hypertonic, which of course we never do, but suppose we did, then that would make this area, the plasma, less watery. Osmosis is the movement of water from a watery area to a less watery area, so I think you can see now that the water molecules that are in the red cell would move out by osmosis in an attempt to, to dilute the hypertonic plasma medium. And what that would mean is that the cells would crenellate. They would just become shrunken, dehydrated cells because all of their water would have been lost to the plasma. So don't give hypotonic intravenous fluids, that will blow the cells up, causing hemolysis or hemolysis. Don't give hypertonic intravenous solutions that are too salty. That's going to dehydrate the red cells and crenellate them and make them pretty well useless. Do, when the need arise, when the need arises, give isotonic 0.9% sodium chloride. Then we'll maintain the osmotic balance between the plasma and the fluid inside the red cell. Then we won't get any net osmotic movement of water into or out of the cell and we will maintain the integrity of our red blood cells, which of course is always a good thing to do.